Okay, we're all set now. Um, good morning, everybody. I would like to give you a very warm welcome to our round, round table on government, governance and migration. My name is Eva Völker. I'm a journalist from Göttingen. I've been working for mainly for Bayerischer Rundfunk, NDR and the BBC. I'm currently also doing press work for Museum Friedland, which covers the history of nearby Friedland transit camp which has been in operation um, from 1945 until today. Um, our topic this morning is governance and migration. That's the title of this round. We will focus on migration policy in different regions and on the challenges and inconsistencies of policies. We will concentrate on Syria's neighbors, Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, look at traditions and social and economic ties. We will also, of course, be talking about Europe, where migration and asylum policy is being hotly debated at the moment, not least in the run-up to tomorrow's special meeting in Brussels and the European summit next week. But before you can accuse us of being Eurocentristic, we will, of course, move on and take a broader view of global migration governance. Let me now introduce to you our two panelists, Professor Dawn Chatty and Dr. Konstantin Ruschka. Dawn Chatty, um, some of you may have heard her evening le lecture last night at Paulina Kirche on current forced migration in the Middle East from a historical perspective, which gave a very, uh, very interesting insights into migration governance, governance in the Ottoman Empire. Dawn Chatty is Emeritus Professor in Anthropology and Forced Migration. She is the former director of the Refugee Studies Center at the University of Oxford. She is a social anthropologist whose ethnographic focus is on the Middle East. Her research interests include a number of forced migration and development issues, such as tribal resettlement and the, and the impact of prolonged conflict on refugee young people. Don Chetty is both an academic anthropologist and a, and a practitioner, having worked at universities in the United States, Lebanon, Syria, and Oman as well as with a number of, dif of development agencies, such as UNDP, UNICEF, and FAO. Among her recent books is Syria, the Making and Unmaking of a Refuge State. I would now like to move on to Konstantin Ruschka. Konstantin Ruschka is currently working as a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Social Law and Social Policy in Munich. He has previously worked with the Swiss Refugee Council and with the UNHCR, and he is a member of the Swiss Federal Commission on Migration. Konstantin Ruschka teaches European Asylum Law Interalia at Bielefeld University. His areas of research include international and European, German and Swiss asylum and migration law, human rights law, refugee law and refugee rights, integration and social rights, and ethics of migration. He has extensively published on asylum and migration law with a strong focus on the common European asylum system and its implementation. He is an expert in the area of refugee law and the Dublin system, especially with regard to Germany. And he blogs regularly in Flüchtlingsforscher gegen Mythen, Refugee Studies Against Myths, to unmask myths that politicians create around the issue of migration. The latest about the catchphrase of Asyltourismus, Asylum Tourism, used by, a, by the Premier of the Federal State of Bavaria a couple of days ago. So far for introductions, and now back to our round table. Our panelists have prepared introductory statements. Dawn Chatty, you will be talking about the responses of Syria's neighbors, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan to Syrian refugees. Thank you for this opportunity to speak a little bit more about the response uh, in the Middle East region to uh, the Syria humanitarian crisis. A great deal has been written about um, this mass movement of people, 
uh, particularly after uh, 2015, when it seemed to strike many politicians in Europe uh, as though it was a crisis uh, that required uh, drastic action uh, in order to contain the movement of people out of the region um, and to push back uh, to maintain a kind of fortress uh, in Europe. What I'm going to try to say very quickly in these five minutes with a, a few slides, five, ten minutes at the most, is that the regional response to the forced, dis the forced displacement of people in the region has a very long history. And it's not based uh, particularly on the requirement to respect uh, conventions, uh, international treaties in, in, human, uh, in humanitarian and refugee law as uh, in Europe, but it's based much more on an understanding of a social responsibility uh, to the uh, outsider, to the needy, etc. I just want to go back a little bit uh, in just a very brief history. I put up the map here of what uh, was considered Syria in the 19th century by European map makers and certainly by people in this region, which was called Wilad Sham. And if you uh, look at the map very carefully, you realize that that area called Syria extended from Antioch in the north, or Alexandretta, down to Jebel al-Rish in the south, which is the borderland between Gaza and Egypt today. And then, obviously, there's a very fuzzy line into the interior, which is the desert, um, or actually, it's not desert, it's semi-arid land of the uh, tribes, the people who lived in the desert, the Bedou, the Bedou Bedouin. So this is the region I'm talking about when, I'm, uh, when I uh, discuss um, how this notion of uh, looking after those needy, those who need sanctuary uh, emerged. Okay. Uh, very briefly, from uh, around the 1850s to the present time, this region that I just showed you on the map yesterday received over four million forced migrants. Most of them were Muslims who were being expelled from the borderland between the Ottoman Empire and the Imperial Russian Empire. These were the, the Chechnyan, the Circassian, the Daristani, nearly three million of them between 1850 until about the 1890s, although some of these numbers continued until 1920 as uh, Albanians and Kosovars fleeing from the new Soviet Union also fled into this region that we know of as Greater Syria. Uh, and then, of course, between 1915 and 1938, three big waves of Armenians, equaling almost a million, also uh, fled into the region, finding sanctuary in a number of urban centers, mainly Aleppo, Damascus, Beirut, Jerusalem. And then once uh, Amman had become established as a city, uh, Amman as well, and also Cairo. This was followed, as now you know in, in more contemporary history, post-World uh, War II, by the flight of Palestinians, about five million. Again, another wave of Palestinians after 1967. Uh, in the 1990s, more Palestinians, about 300,000, uh, fleeing from Kuwait at the end of the Gulf War. And then in the early 2000s, one to 1.2 million Iraqis also coming into the region. Large numbers of people, uh, and even with the Iraqi wave, you didn't find that there was a crisis in Europe, because the numbers didn't come to Europe. They basically remained in the region. This is uh, just a, a, a replay of that same map, uh, so that you just get a sense of the feeling of the movement from all the way from Crimea uh, and the borderlands of, uh, of Georgia, of Ossetia, of uh, the Transcaucasus, and so on, first into Anatolia and then into this, this area of Syria. So. When we come to the current situation, this is the regional response. What do we find? We find that the majority of Syrians who've been displaced from the fighting, first of all, the total population of Syria is somewhere re in the region of two point, uh, 21, 22 million prior to 2011. Six to seven million of these people are displaced within the borders of Syria. Five million have across the border and are therefore classified as refugees by the UN Agency for Refugees and in common understanding of a refugee being someone who no longer has the protection of their own state 
and who flees because of fear, persecution, etc., etc. You see that the majority of Syrians who fled have remained near the southern border of Turkey in the north. The, the darker colors represent higher uh, uh, intensity. Um, uh, Lebanon, which only has a population of 4 million anyway, at least 25 to 30 percent of its population now is made up of Syrians who have fled. And then Jordan, the northern ring of Jordan, is made up of Syrians who have fled. Many of them are tied in tribal connections, kinship connections, and very strong economic connections. So there are social connections, economic connections, and so on to, uh, um, uh, to deal with these people. None of the three countries well, I'll make an I have to make an exception. Neither Syria, not, neither Jordan, nor Lebanon are parties to the 1951 Convention, which requires non-refoulement, that you don't return somebody fleeing uh, their country. Um, and uh, it doesn't require you to provide protection, international protection. Turkey has signed the 51 Convention, but it has always had a reservation in place that it only, it only looks at providing protection for refugees from Europe. So in the 1990s, it provided protection for several hundred thousand barbarians fleeing the, the crisis in, in the Balkans. However, Turkey now has established domestic asylum law for those Syrians who have come, not as refugees, but as displaced people. It provides them with health care and uh, education, which is quite uh, problematic because, of course, most Syrians want to continue speaking Arabic and in Turkey. That's not the language of the country. But neither Lebanon or Jordan have any reason in terms of international law to provide any kind of protection. And in both of these countries, they look upon the displaced Syrians as guests or guest workers uh, or um, hmm, uh, Arab brothers, if I can put it that way. And the population there uh, is not really secure. I, ca I can't turn this into a rosy picture. Um, because they are uh, in, in uh, Lebanon, there isn't any international protection, but people basically muddle on. And what's emerged uh, over the, the last uh, three, four years, as the governments have begun to become nervous about how long these people are going to remain, is that civil society has emerged. And there are huge numbers of civil society organizations, many of them run by Syrians themselves, middle class Syrians who managed to, to sort of recreate their economic existence successfully in Jordan, in Lebanon, and they've turned to help each other. So you could say it's refugee to refugee assistance, uh, if you want to use that term, but it's certainly the assistance to um, your, your, your brother uh, Arab or your, or your neighbor. So um, just very quickly, a, a, a summing up, that Historical ties explain why the regional response is as it is. These people are not being turned back. Uh, there are ties that were established partially from the migration for the last 100, 150 years. Um, and the horizontal ties are very much um, related to economic ties, kinship ties, uh, and a social understanding of the requirement to be generous, uh, to provide sanctuary for those who are in need with the understanding that when you help somebody to um, settle in dignity, at some point they will be able to return that gesture or that favor, if I can put it that way. And I just will close with uh, what you probably all know. And you could all be very proud that Germany is at the very top of this list. Uh, but this is the way Europe has responded. And if any of you are from the United Kingdom, you'll find England is not on this list uh, because uh, the UK and Ireland and several other countries of Europe uh, refuse to have any kind of migrant quota. Um, if uh, this chart uh, had been uh, a bit more fully developed, then I don't know that we would still be talking about a crisis per se. So I'll close here. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, Don Chatty. Um, before we uh, get back to this subject, I would like to ask you, Konstantin Gruschka, to pre uh, present your introduction. Thanks. Um, so good morning. Thank you very much for the invitation. And 
I will, of course, give you now some kind of dry legal background of what I would call um, migration management and legal standards. And we agreed that I will try to um, flesh out one argument that is uh, based on the legal levels of government. So the legal status um, of persons that are migrating to Germany, and then we're talking of about forced migration and asylum normally in the public debate, and it's very important that, of course, this is addressed looking at the current TTIP debate in Germany. You have international public law, and that would be the foundation. It's the 1951 Refugee Convention, um, as you all know. And then you have European law, and European law with the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the Asylum Directives and the Dublin Regulation is basically um, what is the migration governance in legal terms in Europe. And at the moment, we have a big discussion on the um, validity and also the scope of national law. Looking at it from just a legal background, national law, this is the levels. International public law is the highest level and it has to be adhered to. And if a national law is not in line with international public law or with European law, it has to be not applicable. Applied. So that's the point for that. And of course, for the practice of the immigration authorities, very often these three levels of laws don't play a big role because you have a guidance from your minister or your guidance from um, the head of the immigration authority. So that also makes a big difference so that you can see migration governance is very much done on a very local level in Europe. And the legal situation is very often um, not adhered to or presented as blurred. It seems to be unclear what is in the um, legal framework, and that is, by my analysis, on purpose. And why is it on purpose? Because we have, for example, the German legislation since 2015, we have different goals that governance should deal with. And these different goals are kind of mutually exclusive. Because if you want to support integration and you want to reduce pull factors and increase the efficiency of removals, um, you have different aims with the same migratory framework. And if you then also need some administrative modifications to facilitate and accelerate procedures, then you will see that this doesn't work well together. And so you just put in 20 amendments that are basically, it's now 26, that are basically not a coherent system, but they're leveling up to a very incoherent system. And if you look at the same question at the EU level, then you would see that you have the Common European Asylum System created in 2003 to 2005, the 2001 in brackets means um, the mass influx directive that was never applied. And nobody knows that this is actually in place since 2006. Um, politicians put it like, um, now we are looking at a common European asylum system. We're trying to build it. It's there in legal terms. It was reformed in a second phase in 2011, 2013, that entered into force in 2015. It was evaluated three months after entering into force. And then again, with new proposals, there was the idea that you reform it. And then you look at what is all covered by these proposals. It's the responsibility. So we're talking about Dublin and the Eurodac regulation. It's the reception conditions. It's the asylum procedure. It's the qualification for protection and the status. And then you have a proposal for resettlement, and then you have a proposal for the EU asylum agency. So, and already grasping that is very difficult. And a lot of politicians think that this proposal is already the law. They look at the proposals and they apply it as if it was the law, but it's still not applied because member states have very different interests. If you look at Italy and Hungary and their interests and the uh, interests of France and Germany, you would see that migration governance in Europe is very difficult. And this is a minimum standard here. And it doesn't end there. If you look at Schengen, um, you would look at the borders code. You would look at um, Frontex. You would look at the visa code. 
and you would look at the Red Pills Directive, and the only directive that is not being reconsidered at the moment is the Returns Directive. So everything else has been changed in 2016 or is in the process of being changed. So how should you actually look at the legal situation? It's very, very difficult. Um, and you have an evident conflict of the objectives between promoting integration and migration management. Um, and that l leads to a weakened link of resident status and access to social rights. What I mean by this is that asylum seekers are grouped in categories. If you're from Syria, you have in Germany language courses from day one. But if you're from Senegal, you will never have a language course access and you will not be able to work. And so the status of asylum seeker does not tell you what rights these persons have. And that is going on for persons that are granted protection in Germany, especially with, the, with regard to family reunification. And these different rights um, lead to a process that I call fragmentation, and that is a term that is used very differently in several areas of research. But what I mean by fragmentation is you look at the law and you don't know what it says. Um, because you have to know the background, you have to know the interpretation, and all of this. Um, and these differentiations are not intended by international or EU law. It's done at the local level, it's done in national law, and it's done in the practice of immigration authorities. Some immigration authorities do not apply the German law because they think it does not make sense what is in there. And others think it's very important that you adhere to, adhere to the law. Um, there in Germany and in Europe also you will get constitutional concerns that um, looks at, if you look at human dignity, if you look at the principle of equality, the levels of benefit that you receive in different member states in Europe, but also in different areas in Germany, and the procedural acts aspects. There is some kind of firm belief that the burden of proof for that you are entitled to protection is on the asylum seeker. It's not true. It's the state that has to establish the facts, and the asylum seeker might um, jump in to help with the individual facts because the state cannot look at that, but it's not the burden of proof. But it's now presented as if there are some needy beggars that are coming to Europe and they have to prove that they are worthy of protection. And that is the change that has occurred over the last um, few years. In conclusion, the multi-level and system and the decentralized enforcement of European legislation by member states and the executive federal in a lot of member states led to a fragmentation of the law that basically um, was fueled by the hyperactivity of the German and um, the European legislator. So you don't know what the law is. You cannot look at the law and know what it is. The result is a legal and practical ambiguity. It leads to difficulties in a uniform application, and that is very nicely put. Um, uh, because it is actually incomprehensible for anyone who has not studied that. And if you have studied that, you are presented as someone who is insisting on legal standards that do not make sense. Um, and all in all, in Europe, migration governance fails because of that, and the steering power of the law is significantly reduced by that. And on the way here, I thought, that's not really true, because the steering... It should say the direct steering power of the law, because you, if, if you look at jurisprudence on you can't send people back to Greece, that now Europe is trying to avoid that people are coming to Greece because you cannot send somebody back under the Dublin system to Greece. The same with the hearsay judgment that annulled the Libyan-Italian agreement to send migrants back. Now Italy is um, funding the Libyan um, border guards so that they control the southern border of Libya so that people do not even arrive in the jurisdiction. So there is a steering power of the law, but I would say it's negative. And the governance is by that completely blurred and in a European sense nearly impossible. So that were like kind of the 
points that I wanted to flesh out, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks very much for this. Uh, before we uh, start discussing Europe, uh, we would, I would like to uh, first look at um, the region of Syria's neighbors. Um, Dawn Chetty, Europe's policy has been that, and then this brings us back to Europe, uh, that of a policy of containing refugees in the region. Is this um, policy of containment in the region sustainable, considering that the conflict has been uh, going on and on since 2011? It's, it's really, a, it's a very interesting question. Uh, has containment actually worked? Um, is an, another way that you could put it. I think there are many who feel that the, uh, the European agreement with Turkey uh, in 2016 is what actually stopped the mass influx of Syrians into Europe. First of all, I would say that isn't the reason. Um, that the, uh, the re what, that the main reason that the huge numbers leaving Syria uh, after the end of the summer of 2015 uh, was because the, the double shock of both the conquest of most of Syria by ISIS and also the commencement of Russian bombardment um, is what drove out many uh, of Syrians who had hoped to be able to remain to rebuild the country. Uh, and that by itself dissipated whether or not there had been a treaty agreement with uh, uh, Turkey or not. Perhaps it slowed down some of the movement. but. This is an argument used uh, very widely in the United Kingdom also, where uh, many local um, activists uh, and groups advocating uh, for uh, England to uh, respect the, uh, the rights of a refugee to come and seek asylum um, are growing increasingly loud, but legislators have always answered, look, we don't need to allow people to come, we just will send money out there. and so." Uh, the British argument is that billions are being sent to the region, uh, supposedly already paid to Turkey, although that's not yet true, uh, and to Lebanon and to Jordan, and that that money will be used locally uh, to assist uh, Syrians. Uh, and of course, you know, it's always better if they can be assisted by their neighbors, by people who they know, who speak their language, who share their culture, and so on. But one of the things that we do forget is that this money basically feeds the machine. And I'm going to call the international humanitarian aid regime a kind of money-eating machine because we know, first of all, that the UNHCR, the main agency uh, for refugees, um, uh, does not in interact directly. So it subcontracts. So uh, uh, let's just say for every dollar that the, uh, the UNHCR receives from the UN or from other donor countries, there's a top slice of 20% that remains to run the administration of the UNHCR. And then the, there's another top slice of between 20 to 25%, sometimes even 30% for the local uh, subcontractors then to extend services. So 50% of what is paid in order to contain uh, these refugees in the region actually goes to oiling the machinery of these uh, various IGOs and NGOs. Uh, and furthermore, the, um, the em employment factor is another uh, very interesting issue that uh, is also discussed. The humanitarian aid workers in the region are generally European, North, uh, North Americans, uh, often quite young, often not really very well experienced. Maybe they've had one round of experience working in a camp in Thailand or in um, Kenya or elsewhere. And what has emerged, particularly in this region, which is not that far away from us, we're talking about the Eastern Mediterranean, these are our neighbors, is that these are countries in which the local population of young people are, is very well educated, often they're bilingual, if not trilingual, and could easily take on these jobs, but they aren't hired. So it's, in many ways, the, the money that we're throwing at containing um, this population in the region is basically going to uh, maintaining um, employment for young international civil servants and for these different agencies. I would say there's a huge waste uh, and that perhaps in the first year or so during what I would call the emergency phase, uh, the funding was um, 
utilized much more successfully. But now, as time has gone, gone on, most of the activity that's keeping people in some kind of dignity, not all, and of course there are many awful uh, cases to talk about, is coming from uh, local uh, advocacy groups and local civil servant groups. So I would say containment um, is also partially the wish of the people. I mean, most Syrians, if you if you consider that about seven and five, 12 million have been displaced and only about a million have have uh, left the region to try to find temporary protection elsewhere, that the vast majority are basically hanging about nearby for the day that they can go back. You were talking about uh, traditional and regional uh, structures. Um, uh, you uh, were talking about um, Arab Brotherhood and uh, long-lasting uh, historic and family ties. Um, are traditional or regional structures of migration being destroyed by uh, Western migration policies? Or how could these be um, taken in consider into consideration? Or um, how could the West um, forge its um, migration governments so that uh, there could be synergies? Sure, this is really a good question for me to answer, but uh, it, it means being particularly optimistic. Um, first, I, I, I have to say that in the region itself, um, the more open door policy for movement amongst Arabs in the Arab world has been drastically uh, cut back. So, for example, during the Iraq, the war, or the Anglo-American intervention in the uh, character of the state of Iraq, um, the original policy of Syria and several other countries was to allow Arabs, Arab-speaking ethnic groups, free movement between countries without visa, or with a visa application at the border, which was basically the filling out of a card. And that actually continued until I think 2008, 2009, when the UNHCR pressed Syria to actually put in border control. So the, you could say that the Western states have really tried very hard to impose on the region border controls. The same with Syria and Lebanon, for example. Until 2005, there wasn't even a demarked border between Syria and Lebanon. So there was a freedom of movement for, my, for economic uh, opportunity and so on between Syria and Lebanon. Uh, there were no visa requirements. Uh, you just used your ID card to cross the border. But then with this crisis, uh, as the numbers reaching um, Syria became so great, the, um, the UNHCR and other uh, donor countries uh, implored Lebanon to, uh, to put in place border controls to prevent further people from coming across. So there are now, and of course in Jordan, uh, Jordan very, very quickly uh, allowed Syrians to enter the country, but um, after it had received, I think it was about 20,000 Palestinian refugees from Syria, they shut the door on Palestinians moving, moving across. So there are some kind of border controls. Of course, they're much more permeable than in Europe. Um, I don't really know how to answer that question because part of the problem is not so much um, the individual application for asylum. You know, if a, if a Syrian somehow manages to get somewhere in Europe and apply for asylum, uh, then they go through the legal system, which uh, is very unpredictable. I mean, if, in France, if you can prove you have some drastic, terrible, devastating illness, you're very likely to get asylum uh, than if you are healthy and fine, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I think it's the the problem is that Europe perhaps has forgotten the lessons that it, that it learned very well after World War II, when it was really able to deal with huge numbers of displaced peoples and help them either to uh, return to places of origin or to integrate locally or to resettle in a third country. It has forgotten how to deal with mass influx, and that's the problem, because I think the it, in 2015 it was the mass influx that was uh, so worrying and uh, I, I know that David Cameron used uh, terms like a swarm of people as though they're insects. Uh, and I know other leaders in Europe have used the same. And I think uh, that's the problem. Well, I think we're over the mass influx, but now we need to look at the trickle, the constant trickle of people needing asylum. Um, and you could only hope that the more liberal um, uh, governments in Europe um, 
may start to consider that this is not so much a threat, but it's a actually uh, a matter of maintaining solidarity uh, uh, amongst uh, the countries of Europe and its neighbors in the Mediterranean. Before we come uh, to talk more about uh, Europe, any, any questions from you regarding um, the Middle East, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon? Thank you. I have a question regarding the movement from of um, uh, Palestinians from Syria to Lebanon and Jordan. What is the impact of, or what is the role played by previously settled Palestinian camps in the welcoming of new refugees? Do they have an active role? Of, yeah. Uh, well, I, I just preface that. Uh, in 1948, about 100,000 Palestinians fled and found refuge in what was the new uh, state, nation state of Syria. And that 100,000 now is about uh, 500,000. Many of them were in the Armouk refugee camp outside of Damascus. Actually, it was never a camp. It's a suburb, a quarter, an area um, that also houses many other refugee groups. Um, once the ISIS uh, and the Javad al-Nasra had um, entered into uh, this area and came into direct conflict with the government, many Palestinians, first they were held hostage. There was a siege mentality to starve people out. Eventually, Palestinians uh, from Palestinian refugees in Syria began to flee. Of the 500,000, nobody knows the exact numbers, but it's considered to be somewhere between 60 and 80,000, 20,000 of whom have successfully found a place in Jordan before they shut their border in, um, I think it's called Cyber City. There are between 50 to 60,000 Palestinian refugees from Syria in Lebanon. The Lebanese government was not happy to see them, has done very little for them. And I would say that the main, um, the, the main uh, actors helping Palestinian refugees from Syria in Lebanon are Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Uh, they've been, uh, I, I won't say welcomed, but they've certainly been allowed access to the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon. Uh, and uh, they are being supported. The, the UNRWA, the UN Agency for Palestine Refugees, has uh, tried its best uh, to uh, extend um, health services, particularly uh, for them. Education services are very slow to come about. The government is slowly now trying to set up a, um, two rotations per day in order to educate them. But basically, this is clearly a case of refugees helping refugees for in Lebanon. Any other questions? Thank you. I have a question about Christian Syrians, because I was surprised by your figures in France, uh, which seemed to be the second country um, accepting Syrian refugees after Germany. But what I read is that uh, France, in fact, gave uh, priority to Christian Syrians. Do you, can you clarify this? Or? Which country? France, France. France. Um, that Christian Syrians were given priority over Muslim people. Well, I, I think that's par partially a myth. I, I, you know, there was a point when Germany also said at a certain point that they would take Christian Syrians, and then they they went back and said, no, 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 we're open to all Christians. The the figures are very hard to come by, but uh, and they vary. You know, Christians make up somewhere around ten to twelve percent of the population of Syria, mainly uh, Greek Orthodox, generally very well educated. Um, uh, their presence is felt in, in government and civil service in far greater percentages than their actual population. I don't think any country, well, maybe the US, I have, to, I have to take that back. The US has taken some Syrians, maybe they prioritize Christians, especially with the kind of travel bans and rejection of Muslims uh, that have been put in place by Trump and the Supreme Court yet hasn't ruled on it. The only, the only country that I would say probably has more Christian uh, Syrian refugees than others is Sweden, but that's not necessarily by policy. It's partially because um, starting from the 1990s, Sweden granted a great uh, asylum to many of the Nestorian Christians from Hasekin and Kameshli. And the ref 
Syrians are following that kinship link and the family reunification link. So there may be in Sweden a higher percentage of Christians per population than elsewhere. But I, I um, and also you might find in France that the previous acceptance of Palestinians in uh, France uh, has been Christian from Palestinians because of course the, the, the higher percentage of Palestinian Christians are are leaving because they are generally more successful in getting visas than Palestinians who are Muslim. I maybe just wanted to compliment on that the perspective from a small uh, country, Belgium, where we did flew in Syrian Christians very explicitly, where like 120 Syrian Christians were resettled, got humanitarian visa, whereas other Syrian families applying for humanitarian visa at the embassy in Lebanon were refused. So on the basis also with the support of Christian NGOs lobbying the Secretary of State of Asylum and Migration, who, who's got the discretionary power to decide to get to give a humanitarian visa or not. So there we saw a very deliberate selection of Christian Syrians being flew in, and there has even been an, uh, a declaration adopted in the Parliamentary Assembly to give priority to the protection of religious minorities in crisis in the Middle East. So that was maybe to <laughs> give a perspective. One more question. Would you? Good morning. Uh, since we got to the subject of demographics, I actually wanted to ask about uh, the age and gender composition of the current influx of refugees into Europe. And it's been reported that like, th it's disproportionately male and young uh, for like, understandable reasons because it's most, these are the people who are most likely to be able to get to Europe. I was also wondering about whether there have been legal responses since there are so many like, recent legal changes that are specifically supposed to deal with this kind of, this, I guess, askew in a certain gender and age direction, either to maximize benefits or maybe to cut, to cut down on so many younger men coming in because it's also been portrayed as a danger, that this particular kind of refugee is more dangerous than women or people of different ages. That's Thank been you. a big discussion about this uh, in Germany. I don't know if you would like to answer all this. Well, if you look <coughs> at the figures, you're, it's true that, um, especially now, um, if you cut out the newborn childs that are also entering into the asylum system in Germany. The, the refugee or the asylum seeker coming to Europe is mainly male and young. And that was different in 2015 when it was a lot easier to come to Europe and where the way was just Turkey to Greece. So you can see that what migration policy in the last three years did is to rechange the gender composition into more male and young asylum seekers because the journey is getting more and more dangerous even though less people drown but if like 3,000 people out of 200,000 drown or 3,000 out of a million then you can see that it's more dangerous um, nowadays and the journey is often only taken by one member of the family and the chosen member is very often then male and young and this basically reshapes European, um, the European discourse also um, because it's now a discourse on security. And if you look at another trend that is for me even more worrying is that in 2015, 84% of all asylum seekers in Europe were Syrians, 50%, and then from Eritrea, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And this group has reduced to 15% of all asylum applications in the last year. So all um, the measures of the European migration policy basically reduced the possibility of the kind of real refugees of the 1951 convention refugees um, to find a place in Europe. And that's the effect of the migration policy and not of the law. It's just the, the measures, the migration management. Could I just add, uh a little bit more on this uh, perception that it's mainly young males uh, coming to Europe. That's true, but I think you need to look back at what was happening 
in the in the refugee camps in Jordan in particular uh, and in Lebanon, where as uh, the families were using up all of their savings, often were struggling to find a way to survive, and where parents were often very concerned, one of their 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 young uh, males being grabbed by uh, militias uh, to to serve, or the young males deciding they're going to go off and save their family and joining one of the militias, one of the opposition groups, in order because they were, the militia groups were always very well paid. Uh, you know, if they didn't pay these young the, the the fighters, the fighters left and changed sides to whoever would pay more. So you had movement from ISIS to Al Qaeda to Jabhat al Nusra to these various, depending upon the regular payments that they got, uh, uh, more than a particular principle or philosophy that they were trying to see imposed. So families were working to send the, the young men abroad to safety so they didn't end up fighting, number one, also because they were recognized to be stronger, the journey was hard, and it was very unlikely that they would send a teenage girl because of the various dangers and sexual assaults that she might face. So I think the 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 fact that the uh, the public image of who was a Syrian became these young men that then they became part of the kind of uh, uh, community of migrants that threatened uh, uh, European women etc cetera, etc cetera. and all, but also suddenly that image of who is a forced migrant who is a refugee um, didn't meet what uh, I would say um, the, you know the fundraisers for these different agencies. Uh, had been expecting because generally the image that you see of a refugee is a, you know, a woman with a child, a helpless, passive victim. But instead, they were getting the image of these young men who maintained their agency and were hoping to quickly find work, uh, quickly become part of the system, learn the language of the country they were in, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it didn't really fit the way um, Europe was looking at who these uh, uh, refugees, forced migrants, are. Thank you. I would now like uh, to get back to the legal situation, to what you outlined, uh, that there have been so many changes in European law since 2015. Um, you also spoke about hyperactivity uh, on the side of European and uh, national lawmakers. So um, what is it that can be achieved by law, or since it, it's becoming more and more blurred and politicians uh, just instrumentalize laws their way? Like I don't, I don't know whether this this is exactly what I meant, um, because what can be achieved by law has to be seen in the context of how the law is applied. And if you don't know how the law is applied, and you have kind of like some kind of discretion or a choice which law you apply, and there is no clear standard, and nobody is openly saying, well, European law is. Um, kind of the law that has to be applied because in 2007 in Lisbon all um, governments agreed that European law takes precedence over national law, but you don't find that in the real national discussion, you find it in scientific discussion and it's very clear. And then the question is what is the role of the law in migration governance? And what I see is a big conflict between migration management and law where the law is very often presented as something that is um, reducing the efficiency of management because it's there and it's annoying and it has human rights and all of these guarantees and, and you water down these guarantees. And the second point that I see is a discussion, a discourse on how the law should be. So the common sense also changes. If you look at the common sense in 2015, the common sense was you have to protect these Syrians that are coming to Europe. And now the common sense is you have to protect Europe and its borders from Syrians coming to Europe. And that these common sense elements of the discussion about law are, for me, the danger in the migration policy discussion. That's probably also what is uh, sometimes referred to as perceived law, so what uh, people actually sort of feel and uh, that's also very dangerous because it can, of course, be instrumentalized by populists. And and what what would be kind of like the the lawmaker, not only in Europe but also in, 
in Germany and, and other countries, what you need to, to do is to like put out all the provisions of the national law that are not in line with the European law, because there then you can't create a conflict between, between national and European law. And as well, what is actually probably very unclear for a lot of people is that international law would prevail. And so the, the main discussion in European migration policy is at the moment, well, the law applies when there is jurisdiction, because that is what the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights said. And so the question for the lawmakers seems to be not how could I protect these refugees? The question is, how could I avoid jurisdiction? And if that is the aim of your lawmaking, of course, your legal system will look very differently um, as the system of the 1951 Convention and the uh, um, 1966 Covenants. Meanwhile, it is very different, difficult to um, get certain European countries like the Visegrad state to uh, abide by European law. So. Um, isn't there any way to sanction them? Well, if you ask Mr. Orban, then he would basically say he's the only one who is really applying European law because he is doing border controls that are obligatory out of the Schengen Borders Code. And he makes sure that all of these persons that claim that they want asylum are in the transit zone and sent back to Serbia in line with this Dublin um, regulation. So he would claim, I'm the only one who is obeying to European law. So the, the problem of the interpretation, what does the law mean, um, has to be solved first. And of course, there is an evident conflict between um, Mr. Conte, who is now in power in Italy, and Mr. Orban, because they both have the same aim. But if Mr. Orban succeeds not to take any refugees, probably Italy will take a lot more. And, and so... And of course, there's a conflict with the states that have argued for some kind of um, quota system, like the German Königsteiner Schlüssel, a federal distribution based on um, uh, population size and economic power. And Germany has aligned with these countries and now gets out again because they calculate. They think, okay, if we look at the figures now, probably we would have to take people and we cannot get rid of asylum seekers, and so we don't want this system. And as long as these, this is kind of the overarching principle, how can I get rid of persons that are in need of protection, um, as long the law will not help migration governance, and of course not the migration governance that is refugee sensitive. So you're probably very pessimistic um, about finding a solution uh, for a common European migration and asylum policy soon? Well, they will find a solution very soon, I'm very sure. But I think most of the people in this room will not like the solution that they find. And of course, they're not looking at the global compact processes. And they're not looking at the European contribution to um, international refugee protection. But it's more like, um, how can we pay off? And um, how many people should we, would we actually take? My example that I always use is in 2015, 400,000 Syrians found refugee protection in Europe, granted refugee protection. Um, now, not even 20 to 30,000 have reached Germany. This year of Syrians, if you count the newborns not, it's even less, and then Europe is talking about a common European resettlement framework where 50,000 people should come per year. If you calculate the numbers, it's reducing its impact on refugee protection. And of course, that's not an optimistic view, but also big agencies like IOM and UNHCR who are legal, leading the global compact processes shy away from the legal standards that are there in international law and they look at the migration management side. And that I find very um, dangerous for the perception of what law does um, to the migration governance. You just mentioned the number of uh, 50,000 people um, that Europe is taking on under the resettlement uh, regime. Uh, the, uh, aim. That the, the aim until 2019, 19, I think, yes. Um, so 
when we look beyond Europe, um, what sort of, um, pers why is a global perspective needed in migration policy? Well, one is, um, and now I'm, I'm turning back to be a lawyer. In the 1951 convention, refugee protection is an international cooperation and an in international obligation. And of course, you have to look at the problem and at the protection challenges internationally. And if you don't do that jointly, you will reduce the possibility for refugees to find protection. And you can see that already if like European external policy, if the policymakers go to Jordan and Lebanon and tell them, oh, we want a new resettlement program for, let's say, 250 people per year, the governments laugh at them because they say, well, you're reducing the standards and now you want us to build a big procedure where you can do your security clearance and and all of the other things that you want in your resettlement programs and we should do that while we're protecting most of the refugees. Of course, the impact of the European policy is also reduced by um, the Eurocentric view. And um, if you look at the Global Compact, how it emerged or the, the process for the Global Compact was very clear. All states were, and now the US have pulled out of, of the Compact for Migrants, but all were very clear that only international cooperation can build a migration governance system that is agreeable to all and could therefore work. I just wonder uh, whether I can just add two uh, other, uh, they're not notions, ideas, but two other elements. The, if, if we look at the Syria situation now, it's very unlikely that there's going to be another mass influx unless the area where the opposition still holds territory in Hatay uh, is to be attacked by the, the government with uh, Russian assistance. I think that's unlikely because Turkey has surrounded the region with its own troops to prevent that. So I don't, I think we're going to see maybe trickle, but no no mass um, outpouring as we did from in 2004, 2000, sorry, 2014, 2015. But the problem is the longer the situation goes on, the more impoverished some of the refugees are in Turkey, in Lebanon, in Jordan. And, uh, you know, the kind of assistance that uh, is, is be, is being given uh, is going to diminish. There's always donor fatigue, and as I said before, a lot of this money goes to just support the system altogether. But there, there are two things that I think have been uh, managed in the past, which could be looked at again. One is, um, I'm just going to refer back to the comprehensive plan of action for the Vietnamese boat people, um, which was put into effect, I think, in 1989 or 1990. It took 15 years to negotiate, and it was uh, Sergio de Mello who uh, was with the UNHCR who actually pulled that together. And that became a comprehensive plan to resettle a million Vietnamese boat people around the world. I know the US took some, Canada took some, they even celebrate the fact that it improved Canadian cuisine. I'm sure that, I, I think Germany also took, I mean, there were large numbers. Something like that really needs to be considered for Syria. Now that the, I'd say that the crisis has reached a kind of equilibrium where there are not going to be huge numbers moving around, but something has to be done number one. And then there is another element that uh, is what the Canadians put into effect. You know, I don't know, I think it was in 2016, but it might have been 2017, I think it was 2016 when, when Trudeau um, welcomed in one month uh, 25,000 Syrians in Canada. Uh, there was a lot of cherry picking. They were mainly mechanics, engineers, doctors, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. That was under, mainly under a plan of, pri of private sponsorship. Um, in the in the UK, there have been small numbers that have come in under private sponsorship. So it is, it's a it's a scheme that the governments accept, but it's the private communities. Very often, it's the church. Uh, or the, I know that the Rotary clubs around uh, in Canada and the US also do private sponsorship, and this is where civil society can 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 I think uh, interact legally in trying to um, take some of the pressure off of what is a pressure cooker in the region. Just add one point to this migration governance and why it's important. If you look at the European discussion at the moment, there is a state portrayed that needs border controls and that the legal standards for these are increasing. And this also is a danger for the um, freedom of movement and not only for refugees, but for um, in Europe as a whole and as for, as, the, as for the principle, we heard it also, 
in, in some of the questions, the imposing of border controls to other states and of visa regimes basically is economically not in the interest of the world society. But you can't talk about that anymore because you see a no borders activist that is completely senseless, out, out of his mind. Um, if you talk freedom of movement would be a means to a refugee protection. But in Latin America, this works. Refugee protection by freedom of movement works to a large extent because you have this area where you have an economic free movement and where Colombian refugees before and now where Venezuelan refugees are protected because they can move to another country and get work. And then we're not talking about this needy, vulnerable, helpless people. Um, and I think that is a big danger in, in this discussion as well. This, of course, has to do with uh, creating legal ways of migration rather than uh, criminalizing and securitizing uh, borders. And yeah, um, getting back to the global compact on refugees, um, will it help improve global um, governance of migration, even though it is not legally binding? That, that's a very difficult question um, because if you look at the draft, at the current draft. It's still very much focused on returns are the preferred solution um, for refugees. And if you talk to refugees, of course, return might also be, for a lot of refugees, the preferred solution, but not returns into danger. And the, the problem, if you look at return programs, I know a bit about the return programs to Afghanistan run by UNHCR. It's a return program. People return, then they get displaced again, and then they go to Pakistan and Iran again. And if these are the return programs that are in the global compacts and they've funded a bit more, it will not help refugee protection. But of course, there are a lot of states that know that. And w my hope is that on the UN level, the discussions are far less heated and far more um, sensible than, than there are in Europe at the moment. And this is why I think we shouldn't underestimate a global compact if it really comes to light that has elements that also say the 1951 Convention is still the basis and we will not change it. If we look at uh, the three bigger regions in the world, uh, Europe, America and Australia, um, is the political world learning from cross-regional perspectives or what can we learn from other world regions? I'm going to put my, my, my foot in my mouth. I don't think we have much to learn from Australia. Let me just say that. <laughs> um, I, I think uh, Australia, it's, it seems to me, is in breach of a great deal of the international uh, uh, refugee law that exists. Um, but I think, you know, as I tried to say at the very beginning, um, if we come back to ideas of people power, I think civil society can be more active and can... Uh, can um, work to try and uh, um, change some of the practices of their own government. Um, certainly in the United Kingdom, uh, in terms of unaccompanied Syrian refugee youth who were, um, there were close to 2,000 in the jungle, uh, many of them with relatives in the UK trying to get to the UK, uh, so therefore were resisting uh, registering as uh, uh, refugees in France. Um, this, uh, as a phenomena, was uh, discovered, so I can see, by some uh, British celebrities, many of them going to visit uh, the refugees, including people like uh, Colin Firth. Uh, I'm just trying to think of some of the actors and actresses who went. Um, so the, the, the entertainment industry became aware of this. The um, large NGOs in the UK, like Citizens Action, Citizens UK, became involved. And they forced a matter through the parliament, which was called the Dubs Amendment, to bring these 2,000 Syrians to the UK. Uh, the Home Office, however, dragged its feet. Uh, they brought over about 200, and then they allowed the, the what I'm going to call the tabloid press to circulate uh, all kinds of wild stories about how some of these um, Syrian youth didn't look like teenagers, but looked more like grown men, etc. A lot of negative publicity was being 
um, promulgated by the press, but the, these same NGOs worked and worked and worked and kept on pushing their MPs, kept on pushing in Parliament, and eventually they succeeded in getting another 800 to the UK. So they were, they were getting the, U, the UK to respect international law, particularly about the rights of a child, about the rights to seek asylum, about the right to family reunification. Um, but if the, if the local society had not been active, these youth who were dispersed all around France with promises that within the next few weeks they would, uh, they, they would be reunited, their families would still be in limbo. And we do know already that the, uh, I mean, this could be some sort of scaremongering, but the, the, the rate of suicide amongst this group is especially high and is now of real concern in the United Kingdom. And that might also turn the tide in public opinion when these kind of uh, issues emerge. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Oh, perfect. Um, I actually have a question um, about the common European asylum system. Your, what you think about it in a way, because putting together your um, two speeches, you're saying that um, actually most refugees are accommodated in the countries who have never signed the Geneva Convention, or um, just was like Turkey, just was an exception for European citizens. And then we see um, that still in Europe we apparently have this common asylum system already. Um, do you think um, it can only be uh, also be used to kind of try to um, more work on protecting borders and um, going in the direction of keeping people out, um, also apart from this amendments you were commenting on, like national law that is kind of obscuring? Um, the possibilities that are actually planned in the European asylum system because like looking at the practice like when we see what YASO is for example doing at the moment um, in the area of asylum applications what would you overall estimate like is it um, more in the direction of allowing more refugees into Europe or can it also be used um, as more like securing borders in a way? Well, if we look at the common European asylum system as such, then um, the, the point for me would be if you reach European jurisdiction, you have a good chance to be recognized because it adheres to international standards for the qualification as a refugee and subsidiary protection even extends this protection um, in line with the jurisprudence of the European Court of Human Rights. So you have a good chance to get a status if you reach Europe. The problem that I see is more a Schengen than a common European asylum system problem. But it, there is, a, in the public discourse at the moment, um, a link between the two where basically a lot of states say, um, well, we can do this common European asylum system, but only if it's secured that persons that arrive in Europe do not move to another country, so freedom of movement within Europe is endangered, and if we have effective um, external border controls. And this is not a common European asylum system question, it's a question of how to deal with the Schengen area. We, of course it's all related, because in 1999 the common European asylum system was founded as part of the European migration policy, and this is also linked to border controls. But I think it's very important to delink the two because refugee protection would, if it was applied correctly, also apply in the Schengen system with very firm border controls. Because if you arrive at the border and you say asylum, you have a right to a procedure. So that, so I don't think that this is some kind of contradiction. But of course, at the moment, it is a contradiction. But that was the effect of avoiding jurisdiction as a whole and calling it European Partnership Framework. Another question, Sabine? I would like to speak a little bit more about the rebuildings of the European asylum system, because you also were saying that it's still undergone, uh, it's undergone a heavy reform. It's still in the Trilog, so the European Parliament, had a quite, quite humanitarian somehow uh, proposal put forward in last November. On the other hand, we also know that the Council and the Commission have their own plans. 
the commission is very much focused on the hotspot system, on, I would call it using the European asylum system for border controls in a way to delimit, to limit the access. And in our view from field research in the hotspots and in the transit zones, we have, um, we have come across this new importance of vulnerability as, as a way, I would say, to limit the access to, to, to rights. So what, what did you come across this importance of the vulnerability uh, framework as a means of governing this new uh, refugee movements? Um, just answering to that question, I've, I've just been in Oslo um, presenting on vulnerability and the common European asylum system. And um, my, my point is that, um, and Catherine Costello has said that already from the beginning of the new proposals, there are two kinds of refugees, the bogus one and the vulnerable ones. And uh, that, that's the concept of the common European asylum system. And that concept is not in reality reflecting refugee movements and the persons in need of refugee protection. It's not you're not a refugee because you're vulnerable, you're a refugee because you're owing to a well-founded fear, leave your country of origin and cannot return to that because you're not protected. And that is very often forgotten. And, and this vulnerability assessment become, will become and is already mandatory, but it's still more enforced. And, and so we will have some kind of pre-screening for refugees that in practice will not help the refugee protection system. But in theory, it's a very good thing because it's in, in the law, it's delinked from refugee protection. It's persons with special procedural or accommodation needs. And of course, you have to accommodate unaccompanied minors separately from adults. That is, in, as such, not a bad thing. But if only the unaccompanied minors get protection afterwards, then you have a problem. And this link in practice um, is not reflected in the legal system. But I can see it in practice and I see the danger, which is why I'm, yeah, this, this is why I'm working also on that and trying to get a different concept of vulnerability, um, which is a rights-based concept that basically says persons, also stateless persons, are vulnerable because they have a special position in international law. It's not only minors and it's not only victims of trafficking, victims of torture, but it's a special regime that is separate from the asylum regime. And then vulnerability could help as a concept. And of course, it's important to argue for that and not to say, okay, in practice, that will mean vulnerability will be the new refugee. And, and I hope that works, but this is a lot of um, legal groundwork where you have to look into international law, not only in the, into the 1951 convention. And of course, there's field work necessary to show that effect. Otherwise, it won't work. I'll just add a, um, another small example of, uh, of how this sometimes works and doesn't work. When uh, Turkey began to receive very large numbers of Syrians, the UNHCR then um, uh, said that it would, it would take care of this issue. You know, they would, they would come in, they would build the camps, uh, they would screen people uh, so that only the most vulnerable were given places in camps and so on. And Turkey rejected the offer because Turkey's position was, we will treat all, all displaced Syrians the same. We will build camps and whoever wants to enter the camps can enter the camps. So in, in, in a funny way at the beginning, it was Turkey it, with its reading of the 51 Convention, I, I could say, that was not going to start screening, i.e. determining on its own terms who was the most vulnerable. Because of course, these vulnerability assessments are also very Western. Um, they don't necessarily reflect notions of vulnerability from within the population that they're dealing with themselves. Um, and that's also one of the reasons why Turkey spent so much money, I think it was something like three billion over the first few years in, in, in setting up the kind of camps that they did with UNHCR, um, you know, standing back. 
rather skeptically wondering how long they could afford to spend the kind of money that they did. But uh, it's, it's interesting that in the region itself, the, the, there, was a, uh, there was a rejection of the vulnerability screening for assistance um, in favor of just providing protection for all of those uh, fleeing and asking for a sanctuary. That's very interesting, thank you. I, I might have just an addition because in the beginning of your question you said something about border controls. The part of the common European asylum system that is most linked to border controls is the reform of the Eurodac system and that is agreed now and that will come next week because all states are very keen to have the Eurodac um, system linked with the Europol system and then you will have internally in the um, common European asylum space or in the Schengen area, the, the effect that was very nicely and eloquently described by Violetta Moreno Lax um, as an embodiment of the border into the migrant. Because you will have fingerprints, you have, will have facial images, you will have data from your IDs linked with these data in Eurodac, and then you can follow um, the person's all over as long as they are in the asylum system and you you even are allowed to store all the data all the time which is also at the moment not possible in Eurodac. So that is kind of a border control within the area and not at the external border. And I think that is a very dangerous um, movement uh, and legal development. I think there was a question around here, yes, please. I have um, one question to Dern, um, which is um, you uh, mentioned yesterday in your um, very interesting lecture and today um, also um, a very strong point, the solidarity in the region, in Ottoman Empire, or let's say um, nowadays in the border countries around Syria. And um, I think it is a very important point. Um, and I would like to understand the difference between um, the um, response of European countries to the refugees um, issue and the response in the region of Syria. And my question is, um, is it possible to somehow identify this kind of solidarity in the region? Um, is it more the tradition and history which um, is so um, important by this attitude? Or is it more um, religious um, base? Um, I don't know whether, you know, it is, um, um, identifiable, but maybe you could comment on that. And I have one question to Constantine. Um, you mentioned um, that um, the Convention 1951 um, foresees um, international cooperation. And um, um, would you agree that Dublin agreement um, from the first agreement um, beginning with the first agreement, withdrew this um, idea of uh, international cooperation. Um, or we could, we could put it um, in another way. Um, it's a very special understanding of cooperation um, uh, consisting in sending refugees back to the country uh, which at first received the refugee. And, or was it, from the very beginning, a fiction? Thank you. Who would like to start? OK, well, uh, thank you for your question. It, uh, it, in a way, it gives me an opportunity to, to sum up some of the points I was trying to make yesterday. Yes, I, I do think that in the region, and it's the region that uh, uh, not just greater Syria, but in this region of the world that um, 
was part of the Ottoman Empire for four or five hundred years. There are common social institutions, and I, I would say that the institution of, uh, in Arabic, we would call it, we would talk of karam and sharaf, of generosity, hospitality, uh, not just to your neighbor, but to the stranger, to the person in need, is a very important institution which Im improves your own standing in the community. So when you are generous, uh, when you provide generously for uh, somebody in need, it increases your honor, your sharaf. And this is uh, on an individual basis. It's also on a family basis, group basis. And it's been adopted uh, by also in terms of leadership. So you could hear King Abdullah talking at the beginning about their, their welcoming their fellow uh, brothers. Uh, this is you know, part of the requirement in our society. You could hear uh, you know, Bashar al-Assad using the same kind of vocabulary for the Iraqis. And now, even in Turkey, you hear the same kind of terminology, mainly about welcoming uh, the musafir, the temporary visitor. Um, so this is, these are, I think, important social institutions. Religion is also important. Um, I've tried to move away from that, but the religious understanding is there. There are many terminologies to talk about how it's a religious duty. And now, recently, even uh, Erdogan has begun to talk about the, the, the Ansar wal Muhajir, you know, the, uh, referring back to the time of Muhammad and the the the, the migration of his followers um, from Mecca to Yathrib, uh, and how these are people have to be honored, but I think these same these same institutions exist in the West, but perhaps they're they're not they're not the the. We can activate them more because in the West, I mean, I was looking back at some of the organizations that have worked with refugees, um, and always confound, you know, dumbfounded by how active Caritas and Catholic agencies have been working to help refugees, whether they're Catholic or Protestant or Muslim or Jewish, it didn't really matter. This is coming out of also uh, a, a religious sentiment. So the religious sentiment has always been there as well as what I consider the social sentiment, but it needs to be activated a little bit more. Um. To start with, I don't agree that the Dublin system in the beginning was um, um, not taking international cooperation out of the 1951 convention seriously, because the Dublin system emerged for persons that have been denied protection in one state and moved to the next state, um, to, um, to the next asylum system. So the birth of the Dublin system was to deal with persons that are not under the 1951 convention to deal with rejected asylum seekers and that is um, there's no obligation from the 1951 convention the problem with dublin actually began in 2003 when it was a regulation and then they tried to prevent asylum shopping and give every asylum seeker the possibility to ask for asylum in one member state so that so there would be no refugees in orbit and of course, these two aims are mutually exclusive. And at the moment, Dublin is a system to admin, which gives you an administrative procedure that hinders access to the in merits procedure. And in that, it is a violation of the 1951 convention, but that's the application. And from my perspective, not the design of the system. If the system was designed or was applied as it is designed, it would give every person access to a full procedure under the 1951 convention. But that's not how member states apply it at the moment. That I think that's the problem with the Dublin system. And of course, I'm always arguing for it is a very good idea to have international cooperation um, where it's very clear who is responsible if the system then provides the protection under the 1951 convention. And that's the next problem of the system. If you look at Greece, Bulgaria, Hungary, um, the conditions in Malta, but you could also look at Liechtenstein. If a person would be there and can't move because of the Dublin system, you're in a very tiny country, and what are your perspectives? And so, um, and that's the problem, that the freedom of movement that comes with the refugee status is not applied in Europe after recognition. And then the system is um, kind of like fragmented as well as the law is. Thank you. I think there's a time for a final question. Uh, 
Thank you. My question goes in line with this solidarity and altruism problem. Uh, I think we really have one in Europe, and uh, I think there is also a difference between the north and the south of Europe as well, and between many, many countries among themselves. So, and then my question is, we have free circulation of workers in Europe since 1992, and uh, we haven't seen that everybody is going to the same country, and some countries are much better off than others. And for ex just to give a very simple example, in Spain, uh, we had many, many uh, migrants from Romania. But when we had the crisis in 2007 or 8, many went back to Romania. The ones that had a job stay, many others went back. I mean, I, and nothing happened. And then uh, I think uh, if uh, there were a free movement in Europe also for refugees, I don't think there would be a big problem. I think it would be much more easy. And therefore, I want to have your opinion on this. And if you think this could be feasible, and if this problem of perception that we have uh, among the population, if it can be solved, and then if the politicians could do <laughs> maybe something about it. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we take, okay, uh, yeah. just wanted to ask how realistic is a uh, is opening a green or a safe zone within Syria to uh, to for the refugees to be sent back to Syria where refugees from Turkey Lebanon Europe Jordan or wherever okay thank you and the very last question we can take Thank you. So I, I have a question um, regarding these social institutions of hospitality and generosity that you refer to and that you mentioned they exist in the West as well and they could be maybe reinforced in the West. And I was just wondering, I, I think yesterday you used the term of a, um, an obligation-based system that the protection is an obligation by the community. And I was wondering to what degree that could be mutually reinforcing the rights-based system where people have, can claim a right to be protected or whether they are mutually exclusive because although this is an, um, an obligation, it's also somewhat discretionary because uh, you offer hospitality um, um, discretionary. And I was wondering, do you think there is a contradiction between the European or the Western, the international law rights-based system and the obligation-based system you refer to? Okay, thank you. I just will begin. Uh, I don't think I can say very much about the free movement of refugees in Europe. I, I agree. It seems to me that if the if free movement within Europe works, you know, because it, people move where there are opportunities. In my imagination, uh, that uh, the free movement of refugees in Europe wouldn't be a threat either. The problem is the asylum seeking. Um, because of the way in which we have this discourse of, of securitization, uh, weeding out individuals who might be a threat or who might belong to terrorist groups and so on. Uh, you know, once that kind of screening is taking place, I'm not sure that that uh, free movement would would be a, a threat to European unity, but I, I have to leave that to Constantine to, to say a little bit more about. I will say something about the safe zones. The, the safe zones in Syria have been discussed. Uh, the Lebanese government, which has basically been sort of standing at the side uh, some politicians talking about creating a safe zone on the border. Um, you could say, in effect, that there is a safe zone right now, and that's in the area around the Idlib province, Hatay, because uh, Turkish troops are really defending all the crossing points between that region and uh, the, the Syrian government. But safe zones don't work uh, uh, unless at least one major power uh, is prepared to provide massive support and also air cover. So the safe zone that worked very effectively after the Gulf War, uh, I think it was called, I think it was called provide comfort uh, for the Kurds who Turkey did not want to enter into Turkey, but were fleeing uh, from, um, uh, from Iraq, from Saddam Hussein, um, were provided with a safe zone, but this was really uh, underwritten by the US government, the US Air Force, the US military. I don't see that happening in Syria unless Russia were to do that, but Russia seems to be quite keen on consolidating 
the government's hold on the whole of the country. So this region around Idlib, where there are about two or three million people living in the area that held by the opposition, um, I, I don't see that as feasible. And Lebanon might talk about trying to set up a safe zone, but unless it has international support and a lot of input, it really can't happen. And the last question that was addressed here, I think, yes, I think what the point I wanted to come to is that a rights-based approach is not incompatible with a society, a grassroots level, a social-based uh, approach to the duty to provide um, sanctuary. I think what we need is a holistic approach, which brings law and social, um, I could say customary understandings of application of responsibility together, and then we can move forward. Um, so I think I don't have to answer on the last two questions because this last comment I would have said the same that you, if you have an obligation-based system, um, it needs to match up with the legal system. And the, and the problem that is at the moment presented in um, especially German media is that the population wants something different. Um, but um, you would have the same votes on as on the border closings on the death penalty in Germany. Um, if you pre portray um, the person's bad enough, and at the moment the portrayal of um, especially refugees and asylum seekers in the tabloid media is very, very bad. And that also hinders a discourse on solidarity, because the discourse on solidarity is dependent on that you believe that there is somebody um, you need to be solidary with. And, and I think this discourse is not there, and the assumptions in Europe on pull factors, they are very, um, I said, nationalistic-based. Um, people in Germany believe if all European borders were open and a free movement for refugees would be possible, all refugees would come to um, Germany. And if you ask persons in Sweden or Norway, I've been to conferences there, they have the same discourse. If all borders were open, everybody would come to Sweden. And of course, um, that can't work because everybody's already in Germany or in <laughs> Switzerland. Um, and so the, so the problem is that we have this idea, where would I go if I would be endangered? And of course, I would go home. But for the refugees, that's not home. And they have other motivations to move. And the alleged pull factors of social systems are virtually non-existent before um, you get into that European discourse. And all, um, all research that I know points to that, and there's still no discussion on that. So the problem how you could have a discussion that is kind of facts-based on this issue, I'm still um, very much struggling with it, but not giving it up. I, I think it's very important to move the facts forward and get out of this um, nationalistic, I would go to Germany, so everybody would. Um, and then you can start with economic research, with anthropological research, also with legal research. You need to have demographics that show the statistics that are telling that this is also not the truth, but before you have to have to create some kind of solidarity uh, or an obligation to protect. On a more in a moral sense, I think that would be the aim. Okay, thanks very much. Before we wrap it up, may I ask you for a brief final statements, two of you? I've tried to put my final statement <laughs> into that, so I'm passing to you. Well, I think I actually gave my final statement in response to that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then uh, thanks very much for this very interesting discussion. Uh, also, thanks to all of you. And uh, now there's coffee prepared, I think, and uh, we can continue our uh, chats over a coffee. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you.